Hey there, bestie. I'm Luria Me, your What to Read Next podcast host. Join me as we dive into exciting new reads that'll have you reaching for your TBR pile in no time. From group and mysteries to spicy romances, we'll explore it all and help you find your next favorite book. So grab a cup of tea, cozy it up, and let's discover some amazing reads together. Welcome to the What to Read Next podcast. I am so happy to have you all back. So today's guest is Julia. So we're going to sparkle all things Richardshire, Fallen, Theories, what to watch, what to expect from the season three series. And I have to start off that I watched the first season, loved it. DNF the second season because I hated the love triangle and what they did to it's a, it's a the book. Okay. So I, I am... Has a chance about season three. I love Colleen Penelope's book. I read it before the series was announced. I read it, I loved it. That was my favorite book. And then I am hesitant. So I have Julia here to walk me through all the theories, walk me through her predictions, and, and talk about Colleen and what to expect, and maybe convince me to watch the season. So, Julia, yes. first of all, introduce yourself. Tell us who you are. What are you doing? Exactly. Oh, okay. Also, sorry. Inter- I introduced. I interrupted or whatever. But yeah, sorry. I interrupted. I just can't listen to the slander against season two. Season two is the superior season, and I will fight like this till the day I die because Anthony has my heart. Was the love triangle annoying? It went on for way too long. Yes, but was it also a necessary plot device because they couldn't have the book be the exact same? It couldn't be the exact same premise as book one of being like caught in like a thing so it it was necessary but okay but but that's besides the point we're on to a new couple pollen and Can- and penelope i said pollen penelope and colin i will go into it saying that i was not super excited about this season until the promotion started because i was excited for Britain to be back because like i said i've seen season two an unhealthy amount of times like i can quote it like a lot of anthony's lines i know by heart but I wasn't super thrilled about it because, let's be real, I mean, like, Penelope's kind of a bitch. I love Nicola Coughlin. She's great. But Penelope is, like, not the best character, but she is. It's so important to the story. And I've always thought that Colin was a little, like, boring. Like, book Colin, if you've you've read the books, book Colin is, like, ten times better. (laughs) Not even close. Even though he is also a little mentally unstable, which... I think people don't talk about because I reread it recently and I was like, wow, you like to talk about how mild mannered you are, but then you're going off on like the smallest thing. So he is an interesting character. Maybe he's a little neuro spicy. I could I appreciate because maybe he hard to fixate on traveling and just doing his own thing. And there's there's nothing wrong with it. I think when the books were written, people were not talking about our mental health, our mental, oh, our spicy nature of self. They were not talking about that. Uh, but to run 20 years ago. So. Yeah. I mean, I always, I, I've told people this and it makes them feel old and I feel bad for them. But the first book, The Duke and I, came out in 2000. When did I, when was I born? 2000. The books have been out. The first book has been out as long as I've been alive on this God Green's earth, you know? Like, I talked to my mom, and she said she remembers reading it when I was an infant. Like, yeah. and thinking about that is kind of insane. So that's why I feel like we have to give it lots of grace to the books, because the books did build the show, which I love so much, and has made me into historical and all these things that I never would have been otherwise. But it also is a very much a book of its time. Like, there are a lot of things in the book that are not great. Let's talk really frankly about Penelope and, like, the fascination with her weight. And, like, how she had to, like, lose it for the boy to, like, love her and all of this stuff. It's not great. But I think we all can see that, like, at least with Pollen in the show, there is a much more focus on both of them evolving as people and growing. And they both have kind of a glow up of sorts, which I think it's interesting because we've always had the show with the premise of like a new character is introduced but this is one that we've seen throughout the seasons and to be honest i always was just like penelope what are you doing this guy is trash like leave him alone like 
he is not he's not worth your time and i sometimes still believe that like colin needs to suffer i feel like anyone who likes colin still agrees that colin needs to suffer but the chemistry between the leads and the promo and the overall premise of him helping her find a husband is so cute I also think that not, not enough people are talking about how there's a new showrunner, Jess, who looks incredible. And she's been working on the show since season one, but Chris Van Dusen left and she's like the head writer now. And just the way that she's talked about it, she clearly loves the books. So I think anyone who likes the book should definitely at least try season three. You don't have to watch season one and two. You can just try with season three. And I think you'll enjoy it. Like, I'm very, very excited. But yeah, tell me tell me your reservations. I want to hear about that. I really love season one, but I think it was a product of when it came out because it came out December 25th, 2020. And if we think back four years ago, it was the first Christmas that we were probably in isolation. And so there was nothing on TV. There was just nothing to watch. And then we find this historical, somewhat blend into the present day kind of like nature and it was spicy and it was romantic and it was just like what am I watching and then I was we had to wait a couple of years for a kid and Anthony and I was excited for Anthony I do like the lead who plays him and I really like Kate as an individual I love her as a character in Lex I love her as a character in the show but I Personally, I'm not, I don't believe in love, I don't believe in love triangles. I just don't like love triangles. I'm like, give, go to couple to throuple. I, I am all about the polyamory. Like, if you, like, you know, like, just go, re, like, why choose? Like, whatever. There's no news. Because I hate the fact that someone's going to get hurt in the end. And it's just like, there's no need. And that's just like my personal taste of books. I personally like just, like that kind of idea so so this is a personal chance of books i started watching it and at the same i was actually more destructive which is the other part is life was a little bit busier at the time 2022 was more it was like i think it came out of the summer so it was just like there was more april. stuff to do april or so no march march 25th 2022 so it came with like in a time where we're just like expanding i was just like i was like in my first year in Tampa. And I was just like, I have other shit to deal with than just watching a show. So it's hard. A lot of shows that I loved in 2020 are shows that I haven't watched, you know, beyond that capsule. So that's just where I am. I'm hesitant about season three. We'll see if I watch it. We'll see if I actually, it keeps me engaged beyond the first couple of episodes and if I like the storyline. But I am, I'm not afraid to DNF it. As someone who has a Turkish TV rewatch show, we just ended after almost a year recapping the show. We ended like halfway point. We're like, okay, we're not watching this anymore. I'm not afraid to stand up in a show that doesn't feel right. Because it's like you get to a point where like, hey, watching is fun. And so it's not becoming fun. It's actually worth watching that you feel like you've read your time. And that's what I was happening when I was watching Kate and Anthony's season. I feel like I was hate watching it. And I was like, well, this is not fun anymore. So. I was just listening to you, but I was also pulling up some receipts because I want to talk about the main reason why I'm so excited for this season. Yeah. So it, it's part of it is because I love season two so much. Like I wasn't, I was excited for season two, but I wasn't as like feral as I am right now for season three. But part of the reason why is that the promotion has been so cool. Like as a marketer, like, I wish I was still in college just so I could write an awesome paper or an awesome presentation on the marketing. Not that I want the assignment, but like I would think like there are so many cool marketing opportunities that I would love to like deep dive into. And this one is one of them. So I think that's part of the reason the marketing is incredible. Second of all, I've followed and been really active in the communities of a couple Pollen supporters or like just Bridgerton superfans. I brought up my phone so I can name the usernames, so to give them shout outs. Ainsley Broom is great. So it's Ainsley underscore Broom. She's like the ultimate pollen fan and makes like awesome. She posts like every day. It's insane. I don't know how she does it, but she's wonderful. The other one is the What a Barb pod, which is a pollen podcast. Um, and it's referencing a, a 
a part, a scene in season one where Penelope says something kind of bitchy to Colin and Colin goes, what a bar. <laughs> so that's where that one comes from. And then the newer one that I'm obsessed with on YouTube is Sammy Bates. And Sammy does like, she's a, she's a Anthony person like me too, but she is feral for season three because we're also just so excited for like the side plots. So I keep on telling people, if you don't like Penelope and Colin, I would watch it alone for the side plots because it looks like it's going to be very interesting. I mean, just to name a few, we have Eloise now being friends with Cressida de Cowper, which is going to be interesting. Like someone who she literally said that she would rather die than be friends with. Her being friends with that person is is going to be interesting. The the creator just like had a whole line where she said that mean girls aren't born, they're created. And I that gave me chills because I was like, that's so true. Like, not that it's an excuse or anything, but I think it's going to be interesting how they tackle that. Second of all, Will, who we've known since season one um, as Duke, as the Duke's best friend, he is going to be given a title. So he is going to have like he's going to be a lord of some sort. And I think that will be really fun because him and Alice have always been like a fun little side characters and like their little bar was cute. But it'll be interesting to see what it's like when they're officially members of the ton. So I think that will be interesting. And then obviously. If you are a fan of the books, you probably are waiting so hard for Benedict and Sophie. And I think season three is going to lead perfectly into a season four for Benedict. But yeah. I also tell I also tell people that if you like Benedict, you should actually want him to be his season to be later on. Because in the books, once he's married, he is off in the country because Sophie's a bastard. So they can't be in polite society, which people don't like to talk about. But like, that's like, like, if you like, Benedict is such a cool and interesting character that you would want it to be prolonged. And also, I think we couldn't take another season of Paul and being annoying to each other. And like, because by the end, I was like, this is like, at first, I was pissed that it wasn't Benedict's season, but then I thought about it, and I was like, this makes a lot of sense for what we want to say. And Luke Thompson, the actor who plays um, Benedict, has been very tight-lipped about things, which they definitely were with, like, Colin leading up to season two in a very similar way. And also, he's given very few interviews, and the one interview he did, he said that he had a really nice dance moment. And if you love the books, you know that... In the in the books, him and Sophie first meet at a masquerade ball at Bridgerton House. And, you know, she's like dressed up in, in her great grandmother's finest and like wearing all this outfits from her father, the Earl, who has since passed. It's basically a Cinderella story retelling just in the middle of Bridgerton, which is random. But it's it's really cute. And a lot of people love that character. So I think we're going to meet her season three. So I think even if you don't like Ken and Colin. I think that's going to be interesting. And also, if you like Kate and Anthony, that will also be interesting because we're going to get to see them be the head of the household. So seeing those dynamics. And also, if you have always wondered, like, who the fuck is Francesca? And like, where has she get married this season, right? That's the other thing is I'm like 90% sure she's going to get married. And there's even a shot that Sammy Bates talks about in her video of a guy where all the cameras were on him for like no reason. It was like, who the fuck is this guy? Like no one has talked about him in any of the promotion. That is John. I'm convinced that that is John, her first husband, the Earl of something. I forget exactly what his name is, but it's th he's in Scotland. So if you've read her books, you know that she gets married first and she, she's in love with her husband, but you know, he unfortunately dies and she ends up falling in love with this guy's cousin. It's really messy. Like, oh, God. <laughs> messy boots. Like, she's like quiet and shy in a way that people associate with Eloise, but is actually much more like Francesca is much more shy and like reserved than her siblings. So I think Hannah Todd and everything they're doing with her character is going to be fascinating. Like, I think, yeah, there's just so many reasons outside of Penn and Colin to watch this series that I recommend everyone at least give one episode a shot and go from there because yeah. i do think it's going to be really interesting and even if you don't like pen and call call in like a big part of the show is that there's all these interconnected stories and that there's a lot going on in the tone i also think we're going to learn why cressida is such a bitch which i'm like have mixed feelings about because like 
like I said, like it is true that Mean Girls are created, not born. But I also don't want to like justify her being terrible. But as you know, like it should be interesting. Also, they have hinted that they're going to have some queer storylines in Bridgerton. I think that's a, I think that's to throw us off the scent this season. I don't think that's happening till next season. Mm-hmm. But I have seen some cool theories about Benedict and Sophie, where someone said that they think Sophie is going to be, it's going to be a, Mul- a Mulan situation to explore his bisexuality. I don't know if you've heard of this, because yeah. a lot of people think bi- Benedict is bi, which I could, I could see as my yeah. king. Like, I, queen recognizes king you know like i see it i visualize it he's an artist it makes total sense and if he was alive in this day and age he definitely would be an out by man but it's depending on how they're going to do in the show but i heard this amazing theory i forget who said it if they if i find out out somewhere i will tell lauda and that i will put it in the comments but yeah. then said it's going to be a mulan moment where sophie dressed up as a boy and her and benedict like start to fall in love and like there's some kind of thing and then she reveals herself to a girl but then that kind of explores benedict's bisexuality without having to like make him end up with someone else other than sophie and i was like whoa my mind was blown i was like i don't know for sure if they'll do that but i do think it's interesting and that's a that's a common storyline in historical uh, romance it's a really common storyline you know, lady wears pants. I think it's the way it does. Like, lady percent, re- pretends to be someone's brother, someone's cousin to get ahead in life to just, because being That's a woman freedom. in that Precious. time. Yeah, especially she, if Sophie is a, is a working class person, even though yeah. she is a nobility or a regency yeah. person. It's by, by blow, I think is the term for bastard. But sorry, yeah. can you work me? No, so I think it's like a pretty common, like if you're looking for historical, this is a common storyline that we have seen in historical romance that might be an upgraded to a 2024, 2025, 2026 sensibilities. So I think it's exciting. So Yeah, no, I think it's it's going to be really interesting. So I'm excited. So just in long story short, I'm excited. So my pitch to you would be to watch it for everything else, and then hopefully you'll also be pleased by Penn and, Canal- and Colin. I almost said Canal and Pollen, because I think, you know, who doesn't love a good friends to lovers? And also, I think we're going to see Colin suffer, and I'm really excited for that. Yeah. I love well, about men suffering. I've wants- met, I'm men, I love about that. that. Ben suffering. It's, it's, a great, it's a great trend. <laughs> it honestly is like he deserves it after how much his head has been in his ass like he deserves to suffer and Penn deserves to feel beautiful and lord Debling is a very handsome man so i'm very excited for that storyline like i've never seen normally people in fandoms like this are kind of toxic to like the rival of like the main love male interest that isn't the case with bridgerton like prince friedrich was a great dude and everyone like loved like him and like it wasn't anything like mean against prince friedrich for i mean for for anthony edwina is not a terrible person even though she's the rival to kate and in this case lord debling has made like people are a fan of him already like in the videos that he's that they posted with him in it people are like oh actually i love this for her like everyone still wants her to end up with colin but i don't think people realize how rare it is for people to be this supportive of a male, like, romantic rival. And it, I think it just speaks to how much everyone wants Colin to suffer. <laughs> and I think that's hilarious. And I just, I love getting unhinged about the things that don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. And that's how I feel about Bridgerton. And that's why I will be as psychotic as I want to be. If I want to watch a one-hour-long video by Sammy Bates, where she talks about the metadata, and she, like, does google image search to find like exactly where things were filmed to a point where she had like a color scheme and she like has done all this like insane work then i'm gonna do that because the world sucks man and that's also why i think everyone should watch it is like i think it's gonna be genuinely funny like i laughed when i watched the trailer if anyone knows what i'm talking about like penelope like flirting with other dudes and failing spectacularly like there's gonna be so many cute little rom-com tropes in this movie 
that I think the other seasons didn't have. I almost Bridgerton knew that like while some people love pollen, there wasn't as much excitement for this season than other seasons. So their marketing has been like spectacular. It's yeah, it's crazy. But I know you're unsure if you're gonna watch it, but I love Nicola. I love her. The fact I love that her so knows. much. I'm like I identify. I saw a video that she identifies all the rum celebrities, all the issues, all the TikTok memes, and all the sounds. I'm like, yep, that's me. So I identify with her as a person because we are very alike. <laughs> yeah, in our in our entertainment. So I appreciate, and I and I'm like glad that she's having her moment and that she's not a 20 year old. She's 37. Like, girl, I love that. What went for you? Then you're having your moment and you're actually doing the things and like, yeah. So I'll watch it to support her because I got to support another Bravo addict. Yes, yeah, of yeah. course. We, you know, Bravo meme and everyone will show that's possible. So, you know. I am really impressed with her chronically onlineness because yeah. like, I'm Gen Z. I should know these things and I do not. Oh, I like, know them. Really <laughs> not as chronically in line. And so I feel like the common misconception is that Gen Z knows all these trends and everything. Absolutely not. Like, I know some elder millennials and some, like, mid-range millennials. Mid-range, that sounds weird. But you know what I mean. Like, millennials in the middle of the pack, age-wise. And they know their stuff. Elder millennial here. I am. I am 42. I was born in 81. So I identify more as a millennial than as a Gen Xer. So I can tell you, I am chronically online. I can know that I'm not on TikTok. I get the TikTok. I get the, I get the CSEN TikTok on Instagram, but I get enough to know what's happening. Um, and so I can, what she was doing the video for bitches, I think I was like, I yeah. was like, yeah, I know this. I know this. I know this. Oh, of course I know this. And I'm like, I, and I personally, and there's a part is it just, I assume that she's just like me. We like the gossip that it's all about that. Like the ton, the gossip about like what is happening, the petty shit that happens online. We like to discuss. We like to share our things. I assume that she has a great group chat of friends and she, she can cure it and share all the findings. And that's like my gift in life is I share my group chat, all the memes, all the gossip, all the latest tea. So they're Calling for what is happening to this world because the world should, but we might as well just know like we can walk about, you know, baby right here or the other thing. Like we can walk about Bridgerton. We can talk about like what is happening. What's the TV had to see? Like that's that's my love language. My love language is sending memes and sending like gossip to my friends. I love that because it's true. Everyone needs that friend who's like keeping you up to date with things. And I in certain aspects of pop culture, I am that friend. But there are a lot of things I do not know. And I do think that, I don't know, TikTok's fascination with Nicola Coughlin's age is, like, so funny to me. Because it's, like, a lot of people my age who are basically saying, like, she looks so young. And I'm, like, 37 is pretty young in the scheme of things. Like, when you look at it. I think it's, like, it's hard. Because when you're in your 20s, I remember I watched, this is dated myself. So this is where you were a baby. Uh, So... I was in my 20s. I was like 21, 22. I was watching Jessica Simpson in Newlyweds. And well, I have heard of that. So so it's a great show to watch. It's a, you know, Jessica Simpson is like, we have come to terms with her. She was acting like a John Bimbo. And her, she was like 23. And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm turning 20. I think she was turning 24, 23. And she was like, I'm going to get closer to 30. And it was like the worst thing to happen. I remember having the same moment at 20, 23. I was in D.C. I was in grad school. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to be so close to learning. It's going to be horrible. And, and so funny enough, I ended up moving to New York and finding myself. I had my Saturn return. I had like a whole life change happen. Very astrology. And so I turned 30 and it wasn't the end of the world. And it was actually my 30s became a much better place. Like it was like my tastes were different my friends were different I had more experience I had more things and so I found that in your 20s you're so you either want to grow up really fast or you don't want to grow up you just want to be like in this place and that's totally fine turning 40 now which is 20 years older than you 
it's a much even better place. Like you don't I'm like, no, I don't give a fuck about shit. I'm like, I do my thing. Like I have choices now that I did not have when I was in my twenties. But at that age, it's like it's hard to fathom to be like, wait, you can actually do your own thing at 37. Because I remember being my parents. My parents were like, my parents had me when they were 22. So when I saw them, they were like in their 30s and 40s. They were like, they had like house and life, all these different things. And I was like, I don't have any of that stuff. And so it's like, this is the millennial part. We don't have houses. We don't have like, you know, kids and we have kids later. We have all these different things. And so it's like, it's just different. I think you'll get role models now in your 20s. There are like people like me who doesn't have a kid, who doesn't have, just has a lot of disposable income. How do you get role models who have kids, not those sort of things? And so it's like the beauty of it, you know? I totally agree. I think you're so right. Like there are so many, like I, I think, I know I'm only 23 and yeah. I'm not. Everyone always, I forget sometimes because I, I feel, I know the little, little stupid old soul thing, but I do think I feel it because like, yeah. I don't know. Like I felt that way when I was like 18, yeah. like maybe 17, 16. But now the closer I get to 30, you know, I'm still like so far off. <laughs> so, you're, you got plenty like of time. <laughs> like six years because my birthday's in September. You're a Virgo. Yeah. You're a Virgo. Yes. I'm probably the most Virgo Virgo who ever Virgoed. Not that I don't believe in it totally, but it is interesting. We one day we should talk about that stuff. But I think you're so right. I think the fascination with her age and like how cool she is is like a really interesting case study on how like people's perception of age has changed. Because you're right. Like people were were those ages when they like my mom was my grandmother was 20 when she had my mom. And my mom was 32 with me and 36 with my sister. So it's like each generation gets later. I bet I won't have kids till I'm 40 or who knows. I'm from D.C. Having kids before 30 is like child like marriage, basically. It's like <laughs> I'm large. I'm so 42 and I feel like I'm a teen mom. I don't exactly. Like I have thought about this before because I like there are people realistically, there are people in this world who are my age and are married and have children, plural. Yeah like multiple children yes and that blows my mind but yeah i think it's like i think it's honestly it's a fascination of like it's a thing like as millennials you know gen z looks at us millennials and be like you're so you're not you're not cool and as millennials we're just kind of like whatever like we're just we're just we were never cool we were our like we had gen x telling us that we're like we're too cool for that and we're too advanced. And then we have boomers telling us, you need to go to college. You need to go on debt. You need to do this. And we're like, we're just kind of like this weird generation. that are just like, we don't have money. We just have like, you know, we have our own like system of sheds. And we just have a dream. And we're chronically online. But we were... We were lawless. Like there are things, and I, mean, I grew up in the eighties and nineties, and so the things that happened, it, like our parents didn't care about. They care about us, but they didn't care about us. If you know what I mean. So I we were on, we were on online chats, telling like age, <laughs> location, sex, <laughs> like having all our online chat. We were pirating music. We didn't have Spotify. We had Napster or LimeWire. Napster was my age. Library came afterwards. We were like downloading illegal music because we didn't want to pay on nonsense for the song. We're like, no, we need this for free. And the government was suing us. They were like, hey, you're partying shit. Things like Paris, like, let us just go around outside because we don't have the internet. We have screens. Like, there's actually commercials. I actually saw them online of like famous people I see in the TV. It's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? I think I know what you're talking about. I think I saw that once. You probably have saw that. And so it's like, yes, it's like, it's a very different, like parents did not care. Like they care about us, but didn't care about us the yeah. way parents now or parents who grew up in this like 2000 going forward, they did pay attention to you because they yeah. saw there was a need that was like, it was a reaction of what need went through, you know? So. For sure. I think it, there's, there's also like, we have more information. So things are scarier to people now than they were. Yeah before like because i feel like you just it's the the bliss and the pleasure of ignorance 
it's leads to a lot of type of parenting decisions. Not that a helicopter parenting is any good either, because it's not. And I know people with massive issues because they were, where they were helicopter parented, but like, it's like, there has to be a balance. Yes. But yeah, no, I feel like I kind of had a, both perspectives because my dad's a boomer and my mom's Gen X. So my yeah. dad just kind of does whatever my mom does. They're 13 years apart. They met when my mom was 28. My dad was 41. He was ready for kids. She was too. They got married. The reason I say this is because I've had some friends use my parents as an example for an age gap relationship. And I'm like, yes, but Susie, it's different if he's 40 and you're 20. Okay. Like your, your brain isn't developed yet. Like, at least do not use my parents as an excuse to date a four-year-old when you were 20 years old. Absolutely not. My parents wouldn't tell you to do that. My parents, if I started dating a four-year-old as a 23-year-old, they would be horrified. Absolutely horrified. So I, it's like, it's all about when you meet them and how they, and like their patterns. Like my dad dated people of all different ages before he dated my mom. He dated a woman older than him, dated women like like a couple years younger, someone the same age. like. They both, it was an irregular situation. My dad was also the first white dude my mom has ever dated because she almost exclusively dated Arab dudes before. And like, I don't know, all this stuff is, and age is just so weird. Like we're an age gap friendship. We've talked about this. We are. Age gap, much. Which I forget all the time. <laughs> we are. We were like 20 years apart, literally. <laughs> almost exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like that's insane. So. You're 81, right? 81. So you're, well, new, 20, 21? Wait, I'm trying to again? August 81. Okay. I'm September 2000. 2000. So you're, it's 21 years, actually. Because I turned 20, I turned, I was turned 23. I turned 43 and you turned 24. Oh, shit. You're right. Yeah. I, I don't know why my math is not working in my brain. I was just like, that doesn't make sense. But you're right. I guess that does make sense. I yeah. don't know. Numbers, man. It wow. is okay. I was in college when you were, I, if I had you, I was a teen mom because I was in college. That would be insane for some places. I was in a the... sophomore in college at that time. <laughs> what? Really? Yeah. Yeah, I was a sophomore in college. I graduated in 2003. I graduated high school in 1999. I was the last high school class. So, like, I experienced Y2K and why should hay is not a beauty brain or a beauty thing? It's just... I, I know what it is, be mostly because I w my mom found out she was pregnant with me right before the ball dropped. Like, she found yeah. out, like, the last week of December of 1999. And everyone was telling her, like, oh, it's great that you're pregnant, but the world's ending. So who gives yeah. a shit? Yeah. <laughs> really yeah. Crazy. So why should hay? So I, I remember the ball dropping. I was watching Sex and the City when Sex and the City was airing in HBO. <laughs> I love that. Like, that was just such interesting parts of like history yeah. pop culture history yeah. I think we can have a second podcast just about we pop could. culture we definitely could cheese and right. cheese. but yeah <laughs> so let's wrap it up so yeah because we're gonna come back after the first season after the first part of the season airs and we're gonna dissect it and talk all about it so what's your biggest prediction that you wanted to occur in this first part of the season oh Okay. I don't know what, what counts as a prediction of which is just like something I'd like. It's either way. Okay. Can I hear? Uh, uh, okay. For my biggest prediction, I think we're going to have, we're going to learn a lot more about a lot of the characters. Like, okay. I think there's going to be a lot of secrets that we thought we knew, especially because like we've known these characters for so long. We're going to learn a whole new side of Colin. Because, like, let's be frank. Right now, he's kind of one-dimensional. So, like, I'm excited to learn more. That one, my biggest want is that we meet Sophie. Because I, I want to have that leading up to season four. I think that would be so cool. And I also just want to see a masquerade ball. Because, like, everyone knows that the costumes on Bridgerton are impeccable. But I think... I don't know. I mean, there's things I could tell you based off of the videos I've watched. That, like, they're, it, they have, like, basically confirmation that... Colin has a sexy dream about Penelope. Like, they've, like, confirmed it. Like, some shots are from the sexy dream. So, like, I'm excited about that. So, I don't know. Let me, in one word, I'm ready for the spice. 
I'm ready for the spice because we haven't even seen them kiss or anything. So I think it's going to be interesting. Like, I can't even picture it really in my head. There we go. And it's going to be weird because we saw them and, like, her character was, like, 16 when the show started. Yeah. I know she wasn't 16, but, yeah, I guess the biggest thing I'm looking forward to but also a little bit nervous about is the spice. Like, is it actually going to be on point? But their press tour is making me think that it is. So, yeah, they that's what's there. They broke a chair, so yeah, They broke a chair, which they've been saying for months now. It's like they're the ones they say is they say that, that they broke a chair, which I think actually did happen, that they uh, just hung around naked on set in between scenes, and that they also filmed a scene in a carriage, which they mentioned in an interview like recently. They filmed a scene in a carriage where they were making out, and they couldn't hear the director call cut. We we could have a whole video on on if they're actually dating or not. I don't know. I go back and forth on it. Sometimes I'm like maybe, but then also I'm like no, they're not dating. I don't know, but it's all interesting stuff. Okay, so okay to pick your to pick it because again, so many things in my head. If I had to pick one thing, I'm most excited for, but also a little bit mm-hmm. nervous for, it's the spice. Okay. And what about you? I am like, excited to see if I actually like this. <laughs> so we're, gonna, we're we're not we're gonna go hesitant. We're gonna go. We're gonna give it a try. We're gonna watch it for a season. We're gonna we're gonna rot in bed, spend Saturday to Sunday watching all day. So no plans until two o'clock on Sunday. We're gonna have to meet with you. So, look, dear listener, we meet every Sunday at two o'clock. So yeah, don't call oh. our business. Yeah. we're just like wait i'm not telling you what we meet for we just meet every sunday it's <laughs> we meet every sunday too it's, it's it's our version of church you know yeah we, we must pray we must lord of smut and yeah. and books and all things yeah. holy. <laughs> no. so we're gonna see we're gonna give it we're gonna give this a shot so uh well, thank you everyone for listening to my rambling i appreciate yeah. it I could talk about this for hours and it's a problem, but I'm very excited. Like, I, I, I think also if you're a Taylor Swift girly, I feel like this season's for you because they've talked a lot about Easter eggs. So I think that's going to be interesting. Perfect. Sorry, one last... Julia, tell us where you can find you online. Where's your Instagram account? Yeah, so you can find me everywhere at Chick Lit is the shit. So just like Chick as in like C-H-I-C-K, Lit as in literary. And then is the and then shit as in the curse word. I I love my username. And it's just chicklet is the shit everywhere. Except Twitter, but I stopped using Twitter. So who cares about Twitter? It was like chicklet is Julia. But yeah, no, you can also check out my website, chicklet is the shit.com. And yeah, exciting things in the works. Very excited. I'm gonna do some Bridgerton themed content posts that I'm coming up with now. So that's exciting. Awesome. Thank you, Julia, for being in the show. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Watch Read Next podcast. If you enjoy our bookish conversations and want more recommendations, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Also, head on over to the Watch Read Next blog for a list of books mentioned in today's show. Happy reading.